This is clearly not right. I'm miles away from the table. I'll give you a thumbs up when I'm going to physically start, okay? No, you don't. Just go. You need to check me. Why don't you move the chair then? Well, I thought you'd positioned it. No, so. I'm ready for a little bit. Can we have a picnic? You say that. No, it's giving you your life. It's off. You but see? it's in the centre of the picture. No, the centre of the picture is there. Yeah, and that My looks... one true love. Um, that looks like the centre of the picture to me. Where are we going to do the nitty-gritty? Wherever! Uh, wherever is good. Do you see the little lines? Oh inside? gosh, honey, it's like a millimetre off. It's a little sausage of goodness. Ooh. Is she 76? She's not as old as 76, is she? She is. Is it six she's years seven, ago? She's is 77 this year. Is it six years ago we did that birthday thing? It must be. Oh, gosh. Would you believe it? Wow, time flies. Yes, six years ago, Kay rented a haunted house. Oh, gosh. It was like the English version of South Fork. It was really creepy. We decided for... But it was fun. We stayed round the corner from the castle where King Arthur courted with Catherine of Aragon. Oh, was it really? Yes. It was in, what county was it? Anyway. Um, it was that momentous. We found, we we fa forgot. I found this house online. We needed a big house for like all of Dan's family to come and we were going to have this weekend for Nana Wendy's 70th. And I found this house and it needed to be cost effective as well. So it wasn't necessarily the, the thing I would have chosen. But it, it just, it was all right. It was quite basic and a quite scary it was just a bit creepy inside and dark and yeah it was just huge I it think, was I think big when, when you take something huge and uh, it, even with a lot of people it still didn't feel very full <laughs> no no I mean there was quite a lot of people but yeah. it was just it just was a bit it was a bit creepy and I it wasn't really my cup of tea but so, you know this is the episode of Nana Wendy's Age how it exciting. Is, yeah. We should try and make sure she sees this episode then. Oh, yeah. She does have difficulty in accessing YouTube. Yeah, the house is... I think no, it's no, no. Is it's it not the house? The... I thought it was because the walls no. of the house were so enormously no, thick. No, no, no. It's no. nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that. Okay. It's called Technological Barriers to Entry. Oh, right. Oh, okay. dear, oh, dear. Yeah. This is a momentous episode, isn't it, Kay? It is. Tell them why. You don't know, do you? No, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. I don't. He never tells me anything. You know what's going on. Why is this a momentous episode? Well, I shall tell you. First of all, it's the return of the new adventures of the Bakery Bears. Oh, yes. Episode two. Brilliant. Yes. That's coming later on in the show. And do you know what? I'm feeling so much easier about it now than oh, I good. was last episode because I was feeling quite nervous about it last episode. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's very different to one we've done before, isn't it? And it's a new well, location. Yes, and that's the exciting thing about these new adventures. Out of our comfort zone a little yes. bit. And, you know, as we often talk about with our knitting, and I'm stepping outside of my comfort zone with my knitting, I've got a mm. brand new cast on, which I'll be showing you later. I've been doing that lots this year, actually, haven't I? Have you? You've got a new stepping cast out, on? Yes. Oh. <laughs> It's like presenting with a fish. <laughs> I am Dory. You found me the pattern and scaled me up the yarn. Did I? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Goodness gracious me. So, New Adventures by Cray Bears, back later on the show. But also, Knitability Issue 3 is out today. Oh, yes, it's today. <laughs> There's some mm. absolutely cracking content, really different content in this issue. And also, there's a really great interview with Lara Neal, which of course, she's the author of the Sock Architecture book, and I'm in the process of doing my Dan and Lara project, oh. aren't I, right at the moment? And lots on that later on in the show, because as a finished object. And there's of course the custom which I showed last time. Yeah. But also, what else is happening in this issue as he looks around, trying to find it? Oh yes, it's the release 
in this issue. Oh yeah. Of your hedgehog cow. Yippee! You're showing the muddy side. Whoops! Now that brings us on to a little story. <laughs> you hold it. Why are you hold it? That you way? hold it then. Oh, there's some mud there too. Oh, look. Kay Somebody sent, dropped it. Kay sent me and I Brian. didn't send you. You offered. Kay sent me <laughs> Bryony and I went out to take the photographs for the pattern. And we wanted to, to go somewhere which yes. had hedgerows, but also nice backdrops. Yeah, I wanted like a sort of stony wall or something like that. Yes. We selected Barnard Castle and... The, the other reason why we were so keen to go to Barnard Castle is because Brownie and I could also sneak in nine holes of golf. Oh, you did on Crazy Golf. Oh, yes. You weren't supposed to say that. It was supposed oh, to sorry. sound really cool. <laughs> yes, we played Crazy Golf. It's a really good Crazy Golf course, though. We're very lucky. There's two good Crazy Golf courses Where relatively close by at Richmond. At the Swimming Baths. Oh, right. Yes, that one is also super cool. But... Brian and I went to take pictures of the lovely Hedrocal and you know we were taking pictures and Brian was being very arty, she was taking pictures too oh. and it was all really cool and then we spotted the perfect sort of setting but it was up quite a steep slope. Oh I know the slope you would have gone up. And, and I thought, oh that's alright, I'll, I'll get up there. It had been raining hadn't it I think the yes. day before. Yes, and wet grass. I'll get up there, won't be a problem, cow in hand set off up said slope, quite a steep slope, and I fell. <laughs> quite dramatically I fell. It was all right. The unfortunate thing was, the cow went down. And my first thought was, I didn't even stop a moment to think about me, I just thought, I'm in trouble. <laughs> really? And Bridie goes, don't worry, I won't tell mum. I said, no, 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 Bridie, that's not. Well, I'm, I'm telling a complete lie. <laughs> Until we got back to the car... Y you weren't going to tell me. I let that fly. I just sort of I let probably would there. not have even noticed because the arm's so variegated. I probably wouldn't have noticed. So we did. We came home, told Mummy the truth, and I was sent straight to bed. Oh, get on. Just for that, you're going straight to bed. What was the first thing I said to you? I said, oh, are, are you okay? Are you all right? Yes. Thank you. Yes, yeah, she did. Have any of you seen out there that lovely new colour, I've been seeing it, lots of, of dyers seem to be doing a colour called Oak. Now, I, well, honestly, I think it looks beautiful and everyone seems to be calling it the same colour and normally people give things different colour names. Do you know that colour, Kay? I do. I, what, what does the name mean? Oh, you fool, you know what it is. He said to me, I put, there was a skein of yarn in my last update that I was trying out a colour, um, and I tweaked it and changed it a bit. So I had this one skein, you know, that was a one of a kind. <laughs> and as we all know, you know, lots of yarn dyers, um, just with the process of dyeing yarn, you end up with quite a lot of skeins where it's just one of a kind. So it's O-O-A-K. And he saw this skein and he was like, what kind of colourway name is that? <sighs> anyway. I genuinely thought that. I had no idea that it was an abbreviation. Right. I, I mean, I just, what a complete thicky. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> that does happen quite regularly with me. You think you're getting some? Well, no, no, no. Do you know what I think it is? I think that knitting is such a deep and interesting subject. Yeah. And there's so much variation in yarns and colourways and needles and that it, you're always learning something new. Well, you are, and there's no reason you would know that, actually. Well, I know now. Um, and I think it's always fun, actually, one of a kind colours. It's they're fun to dye because, you know, quite often with the dyeing process, as, as all you dyers out there will know, you have to be meticulous in your notes, you know, because I would never remember. You think you'll remember, I would, you know, I would never remember how to dye a colourway if I hadn't written it down meticulously. But sometimes it's really nice just to be free and just think, do you know what, I'm just going to throw that in, I'm going to throw that in and just see how it turns out. Um, so I might, I don't often do one of a kind colourways actually because I usually have something quite particular in my brain to do and I'll, I'll just do that and I'll write it down and that'll be the colourway. But it might be fun just to do a few one of a kinds, I think. But then I always think, what if I really like it and I've not written down what I've done? 
So it's kind of a double-edged sort of sword, yeah. I think. Yeah. Of course, last issue. Thank you all so much for joining us last issue, last episode for Kay's birthday show. Oh, yes. Thank you, everybody, and for Kay... all the lovely messages and gifts. And oh, it was lovely. Well, you have my gift from you. My gift oh, from I you. Do. My gift from me to you. you. Sat right in front of you. You I should show, show everybody. You. I will, I will. And I'll show you what's covering up the said gift, first of all. Look at this. It's my really cute teapot cover. <gasps> Look. How adorable is that? And this is where you put, you know, this is like the lid, this is the roof of the house. And you, the spout comes through here and the handle through the other side. And it's felted. And this was a gift from a lovely friend, Sally. Hi, Sally, in California. Gosh, is it a couple of, it must be a couple of years ago, Sally, that you made me this. Gosh, it might be more, might it? Time just goes so quick. And I love it. And it covers the teapot and it's, it keeps the teapot so warm and lovely because it's felted. I don't know what yarn it is, Sally, but it'll be something, you know, like a, quite a robust wool, obviously, that's not superwash. And she felted it and then, look, she hand-stitched little flowers. Oh, it's just fabulous, isn't it? I love it. And I do use this a lot, uh, and particularly so now with Dan's gift. Let me just pop that there. I've wanted for ages, do you know you see these teapots with a cup underneath and the teapot sits on top of the cup when they're like stored. And I've wanted one for ages and ages and ages. And Dan got me one for my birthday and this is the teapot. Can I just say before you show it that getting this teapot was like the hunt for the holy grail. Yeah, they're quite tricky to find. So I could I mean... find cheap ones mm. that looked cheap and I could find hugely expensive ones that actually looked awful and there was nothing in between and it's just unbelievable that it transpired that I recalled Kay picking up one I of did, these yeah. in a particular yeah, shop yeah. and I thought and you remembered yes we, we spun Kay a complete load of twaddle <laughs> telling her that we were going on a quest for ice cream which we did too it was a good actually, it was a... It was a well you had to get that to cover up yes, the Yes, it was a win-win situation. And he, he, we went in there and the, 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 there was so much choice. It was brilliant. It was very cute. And it's by, it's Royal Worcester. That's the collection, if you want to see it. So there's a saucer and I'll show you the saucer's got little feathers and little leaves. It's lovely actually. Isn't it sweet? And the teapot, look at the teapot. Oh, hello. <laughs> I'm so cute. I'm a little fluffy owl. Yeah, I think this And is he's a... on the other side too, the same print on the other side. And then the cup. With, with the presence of, of wildlife, Kate. Look, baby owls. This is an opportunity oh, to so show sweet. everyone how you would call these little chicks to you if we were actually seeing them in real life. Show us. No. No, no, go on, go on. People need to know He's this. He's making fun of my universal animal call. Try it, try it. It works. Go on, go on. No, you're making fun of me. Now, I've seen firsthand how well this universal animal call works. It works for every animal. We were on holiday in Cumbria and oh, we went don't. out seriously the story, into the wilds. I mean, we're talking the wilds. It, it, it was, uh, what, what did they call them? Uh, it was Border Reavers Country. Oh yeah, it was. And it, it was like Cumbria, the north of Cumbria. On just bordering yeah, into Scotland. Yeah. The landscape is stunning. Hol uh, there was a cross. There, there was an mm. old Celtic cross that was like really, really old. But we found, it was a little castle, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And we went into this little castle. It was castle. like on a farm, wasn't yes, it? Yes, yes part of the farmer's land. And Kay decided to demonstrate to me her universal animal call because there was a donkey just roaming free within within the ground. So clearly it was very tame. So you did this, didn't you? And let me tell you... Doesn't everybody do that to get animals to... Let me tell you, it worked a little bit too well. A little bit of running went on, which is not the thing to do. I know, you're not supposed to run, you're supposed to stand I'm going, still. Stop running, <laughs> stop running. But she's like, oh, oh, come on, leave me alone. Look, this is a knitting podcast. It is. And it's about time that we found out, Kay Jones, yeah. what's on your needles? Oh, I'll just get to the end of a row while I'm finishing my row. 
I'll tell you about my shawl that I'm wearing, my lovely shawl. This was a birthday gift, can you believe it? A lovely friend knit this for me. And it's actually the first time I've had an opportunity to wear it because it's been so boiling. But it isn't this week, is it? It's yeah. lovely. And we had kind of lots of rain and, and wind the past couple of days. And I think that's blown away all the hot weather. So it's only about 15, 16 degrees now, which is just perfect for me. Thank you very much. But this is the beautiful shawl. Isn't it gorgeous? It's the Waiting for Rain by... Yeah. Ah, oh, that's quite apt, isn't it? I was waiting for rain to wear it by Sylvia McFadden. And this was in my queue. I'd had it in my queue for ages and I've wanted it for ages. And, and my friend saw that and thought, oh, I'll, I'll knit that. I mean, how fantastic. And the yarn, I'll have to see if I can remember this right, is Yantan Tethera uh -huh. and the colourway is Peach Melba. So it's this beautiful pinky peach colour and it's 50-50 merino silk. So it's just gorgeous and I, I love it. You can see the lace pattern. Isn't it beautiful? I just love it. And it's, it's really big and I love that because I can kind of, you know, you can do that sort of, not cowl, what's the word? Poncho, that kind of poncho look, you know, where it goes over your shoulders as well. And it's, it's just, I just love it. I just love it. So yay, I can wear it. What's on my needles? It's one of my opal socks for the opal cowl that's going on at the moment. We'll talk about that a bit more at the end. Um, so this is the second of the two socks that I cast on. You'll see the first socks in another segment. But this is the second one that I cast on. And this is one for Dan. And I'm using... This is... It's one of the opal rainforest colourways. And the colourway number is 9245. It's mimicking this really cute bird and it's called Schnooky is the colourway. Schnooky. Schnooky lumps. And I've not done very much of this actually because I'll show you. So that's where I'm up to. And you can see it's doing this kind of really cool red, white and blue stripey thing. And I'm knitting it on two and a half mils, as I always do for Dan. There's the Chowgu Mini Twists, which are lovely. I spoke about these before. Really, really lovely. And then for the heels, I'm going to use, I think this is navy, is the colour. It's number 5187. And it's just this really pretty navy, which I think goes really well. It picks out the darker navy um, little pops in the yarn so knitting away on that very happily and I'll talk a bit more about opal actually when I show you the other the other sock that I've been working on but I just I do really like knitting opal on two and a half millimeters I've discovered I'm gonna carry on working on that it actually I was just saying to Dan the the way that it's knitting up doesn't really look like any opal I've ever knit before you know you normally get a sort of fair isle look, don't you, with opal? But this one doesn't look anything like. And, I, you know, I always use 72 stitches for Dan and I've always never had a problem with that. But this one just looks very different, which is fine, you know. And it does, I mean, actually, if you look at it on the ball band, it does look like that. So it's obviously just a, a different striping method that they've used. So, yeah, I'm glad to be getting back to that now. And working on it, it's lovely. That's wonderful. So Dan Jones. Yes. What's on your needles? What's on my needles? Well, it is. Do you know? I was just thinking the other day how if you were to go back, even just a year, and review podcast episodes from a year ago, mm. and review them with today, I think my projects are much more adventurous oh, now yeah, than they were. A year ago yeah. and it feels really good you know I think I started out as very much a relaxation knitter so you're just interested in doing things mm. which are gonna and I, that probably hasn't ever changed because you get better at knitting those things which you found easy when you started you need to constantly keep pushing the boundaries so that your brain stays engaged, so that you don't... What I never particularly enjoy is I don't like getting into that zone, which I know lots of people love, where they don't have to think, where yeah. you're just going. Yeah. That, that, I don't like that. And I don't like that because there's too much, like you, 
there's too much noise yeah. in my head. Yeah. I think I've always been looking for things which, certainly th this last year, which just push my envelope a little bit. Mm. Push and your envelope? Yes, yes. Have you just made that up? No, no. It's great. Kay thinks I make up all these... Uh, push your envelope? That doesn't make any sense at all. It's push your buttons, isn't it? No, no. Pushing the envelope, I'm sure that that has got something to do with test pilots in the 1960s. Really? Who were pushing the envelope of... Uh, there's something in the air where planes are flying oh, right. and there's an envelope and when you're pushing the envelope I think it's what is it where they go supersonic yeah through yes. the sound barrier that's it I think that's it could be totally wrong I've never heard of that and talking of pushing the envelope Top Gun 2 Top Gun 2 yes right it's the, a bit late isn't it they, they're filming it next year supposedly not with Tom Cruise but the thing is though he looks pretty much the same as he did wow. back in the day I suppose the same can't be said for poor Val Kilmer, oh, really? who's been battling cancer. Oh gosh, really? Yeah, yeah, but oh, I, didn't know. I think he's been doing a, a pretty good job. Oh. And is Goose still around? Of course, Goose I was in know. ER, wasn't he? He was one of the doctors oh, in ER. Yeah. And Meg Ryan. But Goose died, didn't he? Meg Ryan wasn't in it. Yes, she was. Kelly McGillis. Meg Ryan. Who was Meg Ryan? Goose's girlfriend. Really? I yeah. forgot that. Yeah. Well, I sound terrible, don't I? <laughs> How many years ago is Top Gun? Oh, it's the 80s, I think, 86, 87. Wow, yeah. that's 30 years ago. Right? Yeah, I know. So they're, they're doing it, they're doing it. I saw Tom Cruise being interviewed. Really? And yeah, yeah, they're, they're going for it. But to be fair, you know, sometimes he brings out a bit of a doozy, but then other times, there's a, a film coming out quite soon called American Made, and he, play, he plays a pilot, a mm. CIA pilot in the 1980s. Right. And it looks like a really cool film. I didn't know the CIA had pilots. Yes. Well, they were off the books. Because we're not supposed to know, are we? No, they're off the books pilots. Oh. You know, who, who are, are doing adventurous things, right. which is what the, the film is about. And it looks really good. I can't remember when it's coming out, though. But this, look, look, crumbs. It's, I mean, that's, that has made some progress again. Mm, I think so. I wasn't going to show it, but I then looked at the, the, the amount. You know, it really is... You, you mean, should put a little marker when... I've never done that, though. You'll and be able to tell how much you've done then, though. Well, I know how much I've done. I've done lots. I've done a repeat and a half. Okay, done lots. I've done that. Oh, right. So you have to, you've done... Well, you've done quite a lot then. I have. I've been knitting on this, you know, really hard. It just shows you, actually, you just do a few rows a night, don't you? And it just shows you that you do make progress if you just work a little bit on it every day. Yes, yeah. And, you know, it is ticking the boxes which I needed to tick. And that was, I wanted to take my cables on a, a little bit of a level. And and absolutely loving it. You know, once you're into it and you've got over maybe some of the the issues with, with, with the way the pattern's written, which we spoke about before in past episodes, it's not the clearest. Once you get through those and you're actually into the body of it, you just, you're just away. It's okay because we're not putting in any shaping there is some shaping in the pattern but we're just doing this straight yeah. so it's more of a boxy shape which you know makes it a whole lot simpler for you yeah plus it's fine you know for whoever has it whether it's me or Bryony. yeah well I want it to be you well I want it to be me as well and maybe if I lose the two stone I want to lose then it'll just be fine and dandy so if you actually that makes me think if, if you want to take your cables on up a little bit of a level Kay's just starting next week a new tutorial mm. series and it's exciting because I've just been emailing again with the lovely Susan Claudino and uh, we were just asking if she was okay for us to use her amazing free zombie vixen pattern yeah it's a fingerless mitten pattern with a beautiful cable on the top of the mitten and I searched because I wanted to do a little series a tutorial series and I, I looked and looked and looked and a lot of the there's lots of free sort of mitten patterns out there with cables on them but a lot of them were just charted and I just thought that was you know I didn't want to have to tackle another well, something as well as doing the cables the know. idea behind the tutorial um, is to, to you know, to just move it on a yeah, little bit further because yeah. we've done basic cables before and we wanted to just go that little yeah. extra step and having to deal with the chart um, and deal with the, the, the cable. Because I've, I've got to say, 
actually, you know, I've, I can't show it because it's paid for, but I've got the chart here for this, and it is such a pain. I don't have a problem in reading charts, okay? I'm cool with reading charts, but this chart, you have to look in three places. I think you really have to look. I, I mean, do, I'm having I, to look in three depends, separate places. It depends on you as a person, you know. A lot of people are very find charts very easy to read, and that's brilliant. I don't. And What would be cool would be if there was a universal language, and there doesn't seem well, to be, because they the all seem... Well, you chart is actually a universal language, isn't it? Because. But um, why is it then that... People seem to generate their own. Everyone I seem to see. Oh, I see looks what you mean. It's the symbols, a universal symbol for yes. something. Yeah, no, there is. There if is there was a universal symbol, then I you could well, learn. I don't, could I don't you? think there is. Well, I've never experienced it because every every chart I've ever seen yeah. ends up being just a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I came across. I was just looking and looking, and I came across Susan's free pattern. She did it. You know why this about pattern is cool, don't ago. you? Why? It was a first ever pattern. Oh, I know, yeah, it was yeah. a first ever pattern. But the mittens are really pretty, and she uses quite a variegated yarn, which I really liked, and the pattern still really stands out. So I've just started doing those. Yes. And that's really nice. So yeah. So I'll, if you I'll maybe show you those next time once I've made a bit of progress on them. Yeah. If you want to take your cables to the next level, if you're mm. a podcast patron, you can do. Starting next Tuesday, it's time for me to ask Dominic Carter, what's on your needles? Really? Yes. Now, Dominic lives in Suffolk. Suffolk? Yeah, and he sits and watches the podcast with his wife. Cool. His wife is Alison. And Alison's very frustrated because she used to be able to just sit and watch the podcast whenever she liked. Yeah. But now she's got oh, Dominic no. knitting <laughs> and starting to, to watch, watch the podcast, too. she has to wait till Dominic's home oh. so they can both watch it together. Brilliant. But that is, of course, why we love Wake Up Carl. <laughs> Just for stories like that. Yeah. So, Dominic, hello. Hello, Dominic. And congratulations. For, in fact, why don't you come and show us in the What's on Your Needle Stone? Yeah, oh, what, are you, what are you knitting? How exciting is that? Mm. Inadvertently, we've gone back. Oh, two years. Yeah. Gosh, we have, haven't we? Is it two years? That is amazing because, of course, we used to do that. We used to mm. ask people what's on your needle, so and thank you so much for asking me to ask Dominic. Oh, it's a pity your name's not Linda, isn't it? Oh, yes. Linda Carter. Yes. <laughs> Wonder what that is. <laughs> That's amazing. So, yeah. Dominic, come and show us in the What's on Your Needles thread in the group. Please, please, please come show us. I'd love to see what's on your needles. Yes. As Dominic's not here, I'll have to ask Kay. Okay. What else is on your needles? Well, I thought I would bring out my scrappy cow to show you because I've done lots on it since I last showed it and I'm not actually, I don't think, a million miles away from finishing it. But there's a problem. Uh, kind of. So I'll show you anyway. It's really long. I measured it last night and it's 41 inches now and I think I need to get to about 50. The last time I showed you I was in this yellow, this goldy yellow section, so I've done all of this. And I, I went through this mad phase here, you can see, of, of putting in lots of yarn that I thought would deliberately kind of swirl and pull, and this area sort of does that. And then there's a couple, can you see this little tiny purple blippy row here? That was a tiny leftover that I had from my friend Sarah. She sent me some minis at Christmas and I knit a square and I had this tiny little, probably like two grams maybe, but I really wanted to put it in. So, I mean, this is what I love about this cow. You know, there are these tiny segments where it's just the, the littlest bit of yarn, but I really wanted to put it in. And then I did the same thing with that one here, this bright neon -y sort of peachy colour. And that blue there, actually. They were all tiny little leftovers from Sarah. And then I love this one. Can you see this um, greeny, bluey sort of colour? Bryony chose this one to put in. And this is a mini from Alice Yarns that I picked up when we were at... Spring to what? Thank you. Bryony sort of went through the bag and picked one out and she really loved this one. I love how it's knit up. I love the way that that's been dyed. So that's Alice Yarns and she's based in York. So that's really lovely. And then there are a couple of my own hand dyed in here, I think. This blue and gold one was one of the Willy Wonka minis that I did. I did a little set of Willy Wonka minis a while ago now and I kept wasn't quite a full mini skein, but it was enough to put in a nice little stripe of that. This one, I think, 
I'm not certain, but it looks kind of opalish, this bit here, doesn't it? This was from, I think it was from Amy. Amy Osaurus has just had another baby. Yes. Oh, she's the called best name ever. Willa. How cute is that? And Amy, if you're watching, as soon as I saw the name, it made me think of a book that Bryony's got. She's got a book that's got like an actual little rabbit inside it. And the I rabbit's called Willa. Yeah. Anymore. The rabbit's called Willa. And it just made me think of that. And she's still got the rabbit. So yeah, so I'm at... I'll show you the whole thing. Shall I show you the whole thing? <laughs> it's quite long and I have to roll it up when I'm working on it now because it's so long. So this is the bottom here and this started with a knitting goddess and then it goes up and up and up and... Dun, 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 dun. Oh, and we dropped it. So you can see it's really, really, really long now. And I measured it last night because I thought, you know, I've no idea how close I am to being finished. And like I say, it's about 41 inches. And I think, because what I'm going to do, and this here lies the dilemma, is it will be doubled over like this. And then I need to graft these two ends because I did a provisional cast on here. And without thinking at the time, I just thought, oh, I'll just do a provisional cast on. I'll then put those stitches back on a needle and I'll just graft the two ends together. And then I'm thinking, how am I going to do that? How am I going to do that? I've not got a clue because I'll have two. I'm probably overthinking this and it's much simpler than I'm actually thinking in my brain. And somebody please help me. So I'll have one circular needle here. I'll have another one here and I need to you know, join those two circular needles. How am I going to do that? I just can't get my brain around it. And like I say, I know I'm overthinking it and I'm sure it's very simple. So please, if you, if you know how I can do that, then would you just PM me on Ravelry or Instagram message me or whatever and just let me know because at the moment I'm, I haven't got a clue. So I'm going to have this long thing like this and then think, well, how the dickens do I join it? So, but anyway, this has just been my bedtime knitting, you know, as you know, for, I thought about when I started this and I know that I was knitting right at the very beginning here when we went to your mum's last yeah, October. Yeah, because I knit some of it for you. Yeah, so I would have started it around October, beginning of October last year and we're now in, what are we in, June. So, you know, if it took me a year, I don't think it'll take me a year actually, I will have finished it before October then that, I think that's okay. Because now I'm thinking, what on earth am I going to do with my bedtime routine once I've finished it? I suppose I could just start another, couldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I just really love it. I just really love it. And I cast on, I think it was 144 stitches, three millimeter, just a 16 inch, you know, the normal hat circular. These are wooden, because I changed it to wooden when I was having problems with, with my hand, which is a lot better. But I've just left it on the wooden, because I quite like them, actually. But yeah, and I'm just going round and round. I'm just changing yarns whenever I fancy changing. Sometimes it's just a little thin stripe. Sometimes it's a thick stripe. I'm just having fun with it, really. And I just love working with lots and lots of different yarns. I'm putting in at the minute, this one is a fondant fibre mini. And I think this is... It's New York something or other. New York at night, New York at some... New, New, Deb, I can't remember. It was this one. But I just can't remember the name, but it's beautiful, soft tones. I love it. Who knows? I mean, it might be done next time. I've only got nine inches to go, and I tend to knit maybe only half an inch a night. So it might not be done next time, but it won't be that long. I would have thought within a month it should be finished. And then I've got to think about what I'm going to do at bedtime because I just love, I just love this project. So it might be that I just cast on another one as a gift for someone. Maybe yeah. is it completely bonkers to wear arm and neck? I don't think it is, is it? Well, no. Well, you won't know till you put it on. No, I won't know till I put it on. But look so how let squishy. that be the decider as to whether you're going to be so cozy and lovely, you know, to wear arm and neck. Do you remember Susan sent us some hand spun? She spun this. Yes. She really did spin this. She did. You wouldn't believe it. It looks. You gosh, would think you a machine would not had done it. this. You would. But no, no, it was Susan Claudino, and I was desperate to try and find the right pattern to go with the yarn. And then I thought, you fool! As I learnt with Susie Gawley's handspun, knitting a pattern written 
by the person who spun the yarn. Mm, that's so fun, isn't it? To, to me, just completes the circle. <laughs> and and so it, 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 there was only really one option. Although I suppose I could have knit the zombie vixen. She does have some other mittens as well. But th that sort of wouldn't be. It wouldn't be cool to do that. I don't think. I think if you're going to knit a Susan Claudino pattern, look how cute. It's me now. Sorry, it's a little sausage of goodness. Oh. Oh, I'm not good with words. Take a breath. Yeah. Uh, there's only one option, isn't there, if you're going to knit a season Claudine out of pattern. And that's if you've got to do a toy. Now, I've never knit a toy before. No. Which is amazing, really, when you consider that, you know, that's how Kay started and the amount of toys. Mm. And I mean, to be fair, I didn't need to knit toys. And I don't need to no. knit toys because you knit them so unbelievably well. But I just thought I'm going to. So I have. I've cast on. Wasabi. Wasabi? Wasabi. Oh my lord, cutest little whale creature ever. There he is. Ha ha, wasabi. And what I'm... Get off. See, I sound Chinese. What? Um, at least you didn't sound Scottish. Or Indian. No, I sound Indian whenever I do... Yeah, that's why I don't do accents. Because every accent I ever do just sounds like an Indian person. <laughs> it's not good. It's not pretty. It's not good at all. Uh, here we go. And what I'm loving about this is... Doing the knit from backs. Can I look at it? Yes. Doing the knit from backs is just the coolest thing ever. I know that might sound silly to you, but... Never done a knit from back. I saw Kay doing a knit from back the other week. And, you know, she said, you just do a knit from back. As if, you know, it's something I've done a million times before. And I was like, well, what's that? And she's like, oh, oh, oh. So then she showed me and it was like witchcraft. It's striping, it's so cute. And and so now having the opportunity to do that is just really super fun. And I you know I just like the way it's written. You know And patterns are great, as toy we, patterns are great. I think we've always made it really obvious that we are passionate about well written patterns. Mm. Because you know the, the the worst thing that I think that could happen to any new knitter out there is for them to download a pattern which they think because they don't know any better is is going to be you know perfect they have a go the pattern's badly written and so they don't think it's the pattern they think it's knitting as you know what well, have I done wrong nothing nothing I was just trying to work out which bit of wasabi this is and I was just looking at that okay. it's kind of I don't know it's, it's the front of it anyway isn't it right right you, you see, I love how it's knitting up. It's really dense. When she does that, I think I've done something wrong, you see. That's why I went quiet. No, I was just looking at My you. brain goes into freeze mode and I'm I really like, love the, ah! I really love the yarn. I think it, it's perfect for wasabi because it's all sea colours, isn't it? It really is. The, this twist is epic. Yeah. And it's I mean, even. Look. It's like even. Can you see? All the way. Can you see? It's just amazing. And she's done it. I know nothing about spinning. But I think she's done it as a three ply. Is it three ply? I th let's have a look. Yeah, I think it's three ply. And is it called Na Navajo? Navajo? Yes, yes, yes. Plying. Yes. Why are you saying yes? Because it's never written on the badge. Oh, is it really? I'm sure it was. No, it doesn't oh. say Navajo plied. Oh, okay, sorry. I thought you said that somewhere. No. So I think it's called Navajo plying, where you, you, you do it to maintain the colours all together so it doesn't barber pole is that right and that's why it's striping like that because all the colors are together it's really cute and this is like an aran weight isn't it so it's going to come out a bit bigger than the pattern but you know that's fine it's a toy what i really like about the pattern is it's so easy to work out where you are even if you know i'm being good and i'm crossing it out as i go but if you you know if you think oh I, I, I've forgotten what, what's going on. It just, it's so easy just because of the way she set that out and also because of the way it knits up. You mm. know, in a, in, a, in a moment, you can work out where you are yeah. and, and crack on with, with knitting. So I have no idea. Susan sent me a really lovely message saying, look, toy knitting might not be for you and I won't take it personally if it's not. And I, <laughs> I messaged her back and I said, what I can guarantee you, Susan, is if toy knitting is not for me, it won't be your pattern because they are... Just perfect. Mm. And if you, if you don't want to finish it, I'll finish it. You know, when do I ever not finish something? 
Apart from the first I'm ever saying, scarf I cast on. I didn't accuse you of never finishing no, I know, anything. I, know. I just said if you don't want to finish it, I will I'll finish it. Do it. Even if I, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, I it will finish be. it. It won't be. It won't be. Well, I know it won't because I'm loving it already. You know, it, it's super fun, and I know that Brian will love it. And you know, it, I suspect that the winning moment of any stuffed toy that you mm. make is when you put on the eyes and it comes to life yeah and you do that fairly soon into it you you put the eyes in place right and i need to um i'll have some eyes the right size i'm sure that is a cracking fabric it's really dense it you i didn't know what size needle to give him because this is definitely an arum weight and she says on it that it's about an arum weight and damn it's tight so i thought mm, so I think I gave you four and a half millimetre and it seems to be working and you're managing the increases okay with that, are you? Yes. I was just a bit worried that sometimes if it's too tight, it's difficult to do those knit front backs, but you know, if you say you're okay, then... What's so cool it's about lovely. these needles is, what are these needles? They're higher highers. You've never used them before. No, I haven't. And what's so cool about these needles is the, the stitches sort of want to spring off they're, like, they're, very, they're very slippy. I know. So, it, I think you'd need to be, you need to have done a bit of, of metal knitting yeah. before you use these. I'm not, I'm not mad about high 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 sharps just because they are so slippy. But then other people love. The well, fact I've got that to say, so slippy. I I perfectly. Uh, but I thought they'd be okay with that because you're so tight. Yes. I didn't think. I thought actually them being slippy might help you a little bit doing all those increases. Yeah. Well, and and, and the yarn isn't splitting. No. You know, the points are clearly yeah. doing a great job. So that is my first ever toy. And who knows where this may lead. It may lead no further than Wasabi, or it may lead. But that's such a cute thing. And Brian is so excited. I know. showed her a picture of it and she was like, oh, she's not got a whale. That's really sweet. Who, who knows, it may even lead to a bakery bear one day. Might do, I do. Mm. What else is on your needles? Well, I've pulled out a project I haven't worked on in a while and I've, I've picked it up just lately and started working on it again, so I thought we'd have a little look. And it's my Scrappy Ollivander shawl. I think the last time I showed you, I was kind of down here where this single... Green. Am I right in thinking that Casey Andrews just finished one in Barocco yarn? Barocco? I think it's Barocco, but okay. maybe it is Barocco. I don't know. Um, yes, he's just finished one. Was it in Barocco yarn? I don't know what, oh. I can't remember. It's just a two colour one, wasn't it? I think it was a commission. Yeah. Somebody asked for one. Yeah. So he knit one. Yeah, you're right. Well, I'd be really pleased with myself if I got the yarn right. Well, you might have got it right. It sounds familiar. Look good though. It was sort of brown. Wasn't it brown and cream? Yes. Yes. Look so. really good. Yeah. So yeah, I was down sort of here, I think. So I've knit through, and I'm now on this, you know, the the background colour, and I've got how many? I've got uh, twelve garter ridges. Is it twelve or thirteen garter ridges in that colour? And then I'm going to put in this one, which is a knit cosmic strings yarn. I think it was Dreamcatcher. Really pretty. So that one's going to go in as quite a, it's quite a thick stripe. And then I think there's one more contrast I need to find. I think there's one more contrast stripe after that. It's just nice. Again, it's this whole thing with changing yarns regularly. I just really enjoy that. And I think it looks really nice. Um, you know, in just a variety of little scraps, and I think it's a brilliant way of using up, you know, bits of yarn, because you only need for the stripes where you've only got like one or three garter ridges. You don't need very much yarn at all for those. So it might be that you've got like, you know, this little tiny precious scrap of yarn, like I was saying about the scrappy cowl, and you can pop it into there and it's there forever then, isn't it? And you've got it in there and it's just lovely. So it is like a memory sort of project. Um, so yeah, I'm going to really try and crack on with this now. I've just finished quite a big design project that I'll talk about a little bit at the end. So I'm hoping now I can just get on with this and work away on it. And I've, I'm using for this, it's Chow Goose fixed, these are. And they, I think it's 375 millimetre. I did use 4mm for the actual pattern, but this yarn's a bit thinner than the pattern yarn that I used, so I'm going with 3.75mm. 
and it's really nice and I think it's it'll make a really nice sort of summery carol I think it'll be really pretty so yeah and the main colour yarn is um I know the colourway is plum never enough time I've remembered it's never enough time in plum so yes I remembered more hand spun it's speed grass and I, I mean I really I've I've sat pretty heavily. I don't feel like I've made as much progress as. Oh, you have. To. But I've sat. You know, I've sat a few nights when, when you've been sat, when you watched the Railway Man. Oh, I and love the Railway Man, Michael Portillo. If you're watching, <laughs> how funny would that be? I love you. He does strike me as a bit of a knitter. I don't think. Well, he, he would ever go. Could, I'm sure he would. He'd try anything. I've sat a few nights and, and I've done this and it, I just think I wonder if it is lace and how perhaps lace you need to do it fairly regularly when you're a beginner lace knitter like me because it just takes a minute and I've enjoyed that process of, of getting back into that zone I do feel properly on edge when, I'm, when I'm doing a lace round I mean I really do feel on edge because you just know it's really pretty. One missed it? stitch and you're done for. But this this pattern is immense. It's so for hand pretty. Spun. And the, the, the hand spun is, of course, Susie Gawley Flux Capacitor. My, my recent lovely. episode of the Dan and Laura project, which inadvertently, as Kay just said this morning, it's like a whole new podcast. I had not. I hadn't watched it, and I was like, "Oh, I've got nothing to watch this morning." Oh, I'll watch down. I haven't. I haven't seen that yet, and I really enjoyed it. I don't quite know how it's become this rounded half-hour show, but it's really good. I really enjoyed it. But but it has, and what I spoke about on the last issue was handspun and the reasons why perhaps it appeals to me so much. Mm. And I think I I sort of so lovely. I, I can't stop looking at the colours. It's just I know. so look. It's like autumn in the sky. Yeah, it's so pretty. And I, I think I nailed the Ooh, reason. Oh, so nice. Sorry. I think I nailed the reason why it appeals to me so much. And that is because very early on in my knitting life, Debit Fondant Fibre sent me mm. a skein mm. of handspun. And it smelled amazing. And I think it was one of the first, it was either the first or the second. I think it might have been the first might have been bankhead first. that I knew. Oh, right. So it was like this this you know, when when loads of amazing things collide all at the same time and you know what comes out the the, the other side of it. Well, what came out the other side of it was a, a love, as you all know, of the bankhead pattern, but also a deep rooted love of handspun because I think what happens when I knit handspun, it takes me back to knitting mm. that first one, and you know memories have got a lot of yes. a lot to do with your enjoyment or something. I yeah. think. And I think your associations. Yeah, I think the other great thing about handspun is there is no good and no bad. They're all immense. No. Do you know what I mean? It's a bit like I likened it on the Dan Laurel project to whiskey. I used to b before we we stopped drinking alcohol. I used to enjoy whiskey and. The, the amazing thing about whiskey was it's all the same drink but they're all totally different mm. and I think it's the same with handspun and that's the reason why I never started making my own whiskey and it's the reason why I'll never start making my own handspun because making your own whiskey you uh, can make your own whiskey what I'm tr well anyone could couldn't they what I'm trying to say no the the point I'm trying to make is you enjoy whiskey you don't start making it yourself no. I enjoy handspun I'm not going to start spinning it myself because there's so many amazing yeah, different people out I've there who've created I've never had that urge either. And I'd rather, you know, it's like getting inside their head a little bit. Mm. And, you know, you feel like you're getting to know them a little bit. Mm. And, and I think I'd, I want to spend my time knitting. not With like, their handspun. Yeah. <laughs> um, Although I'm much more, you don't knit with a lot of handspun. No, I have knit, I do knit, knit with handspun, but not as much as you. I love knitting toys with handspun. Toys with handspun is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe. well I'm, I am. You are? Uh -huh. Handspun makes me excited. Mm. And isn't that cool? It, knitting hasn't historically made me excited. B because of what we spoke about earlier. It's a relaxation process. But getting a skein of handspun gets me as excited as getting a new set of Lego. Oh. Isn't that cool? It's very cool. What else? 
Well, I've just got one other little needles. thing. Oh, <laughs> I'm just checking. <laughs> Reprimands come, me come all the time. Come on, come on. Come on. He's so bossy, Let's go. everybody. Let's go. No, He's don't. He's so bossy. You can't do this, Kay. You know you can't. <laughs> because there's been times in our podcasting life where Kay has done her tongue-in-cheek things and everyone thinks she's being serious. It's very bossy. Right. <laughs> Um, I cast on a project yesterday and I just thought I'd just show you because it's kind of interesting. I think this will be a new design actually. What a funny thing to say. Well, it's this only because. Is a busy well, normally I wouldn't show you at this stage. I just thought I'd show you. I just mean I haven't knit very much. But um, that's not very much, is it? But I think this will be a new design. So. Will it? I think so. Well, you can't see anything yet. This is of why what? I thought. Oh, for... Will you let me speak, man? Can I guess? What do you think it is? A hat for a squirrel. Oh, shush. It's a sock. I wanted to, for ages, design um, a, a full-on pretty lace sock. You know, I've done three, three sock patterns now. You know, I did the three chimney sock, which is a textured knit and purl sock the prairie socks which obviously have just got that little bit of faux sort of cable effect going on and then um, just recently the incantation socks which has a tiny bit of lace but it's more a textural sort of lace it's not a full-on lace and for ages i wanted to do a lace sock the issues you have with designing a lace sock is that it's the stitch counts and it's the division of your lace repeat into those stitch counts quite often the the repeat the number of the repeat will divide evenly between you know on your cast on numbers for, for for example for all three sizes you want but it won't divide evenly with just the stitches that's on the instep because obviously when you once you've knit your leg and your heel flap the pattern then just continues on the instep and if you want to have you know full repeats of that lace across your instep then it's also got to divide evenly with that number as well and that's a very tricky thing to do not for just one size of sock if you wanted to do multiple sizes of sock now what some people do is they adjust the cast on number slightly so for example it might instead of having a 64 sock you might have a 60 sock or instead of having you know a 72 stitch one you might have 76 you know whatever the the numbers have been tweaked a little bit to accommodate fitting that stitch pattern in there and that, several times i've i've you know thought oh you know that would be beautiful on a sock but then thought well it's not going to divide evenly for the other sizes and then I came across a lace pattern the other day just when I was sort of browsing through various things and thought, ooh, do you know what? I think that would be really pretty on a sock. And it fits perfectly in a 64 stitch sock. But it won't divide, like I said, with other sizes. So I thought, do you know what? I'm just going to do it anyway. I'm going to knit a 64 stitch sock. And if I decide that there's, there's only that one size, then it might be that this becomes another pattern that I put into knitability, you know, just as a one size sock. Because generally, I think a lot of people, I would probably say, I don't know if it's the majority, but a lot of people will knit a 64 stitch sock. And you can always adjust the needle size, you know, if, if you're a little bit above that, a little bit below it, you can always adjust your needle size to accommodate it. Plus lace is very stretchy, so again, that's a help. Or it might be that I just put it out as a pattern, just as one size, but then it's it's not, it wouldn't be, an, you know, to be fairly inexpensive pattern because there's only one size on there. But however I decide to do it, I just thought, do you know what, rather than making this really hard work and just not actually ever knitting it when this looks like a really pretty pattern, I think it would be lovely, I'm just going to knit it and and just then decide what to do with it so because it's a lace a full lace pattern I thought right what yarn should I use so I chose a yarn that has got a lot of interest but isn't variegated and this one also was a Mother's Day gift this year and it's from Deb Dan got Deb at fondant fibre to dye me up a special yarn and you named it didn't you Mrs Bakery Bears Rose and it's this beautiful 
it's like a soft pink and it's really really pretty can you see the little darker blips it's so lovely and I just thought oh that'll look so nice in a lace pattern so I just cast it on yesterday and I've only got the rib and two rows of lace but you can't see it but I just think it's knitting up so nice look at the yarn and it's just perfect for what I want it for you know I think it'll be lovely and it's Deb Spangle base which um, she knows is my favourite so she always dyes me yarn on that and it's just I think it'll just be lovely so I've just done a two by two rib because that is kind of my favourite I think the, I love a one by one rib but I've found that if you do a one by one rib in fingering weight yarn it can look a bit messy I don't have an issue when it's a heavier weight yarn sport or DK I think a one by one rib looks beautiful but whenever I do a one by one rib with fingering weight yarn it doesn't look very neat so I think a two by two rib is is lovely and I just love the yarn it's so pretty and I think with a lace pattern oh it's just going to be such a pretty sock so we'll just see how it goes and I'll decide you know how what I'm going to do with the pattern afterwards you finished yes great look oh well that's nice isn't it it is the mouchoir sock and I've made such huge progress mm. it's quite untrue because I'd only knit like that before yeah, yeah. so I've gone whoa straight down and this is of course the subject of that Dan and Laura project which I've spoken about already a couple of times today and this is the first time I have ever done an eye partridge heel flap and it was great mm. I think it looks much nicer than the other type <laughs> Well, just knit those then. Maybe, maybe we'll we'll, we'll see how we go. And it, it, I think what I've established is when I'm knitting a, a sock, I definitely prefer knitting a pattern sock than knitting a plain sock. Mm. That's what numbs my brain and makes me not enjoy it. So I'm I'm really loving this process of knitting lots and lots of different types of sock with lots and lots of different techniques. And, and, you know, I just know at the end of it, I'm going to be tooled up with lots of skills so that I can then, you think, all right, like you do. I oh, you know, I'll knit this sock and I'll do this heel and I'll mm. do this toe. Because I'm doing a real range of toes, which is just, it's great fun as well. The toe on this, is, mm. I think this is the one which is like a little hat. Yeah, it's, there's decreases at multiple points. So, do you know, like on a hat, top, the, the top of the hat. Yeah, having a repeat pattern it, it doesn't help, sorry, it does help, doesn't it? It helps hugely. You feel like you're getting through it quicker. Mm. Much more than, no, I nearly showed you. Much more than the stree socks, which I'll show you later. Love the stree socks, love them to bits. Great pattern, but it's just a two row repeat. This, it, it, it's more like an eight row or nine row repeat. Right. And that's much more entertaining. And, and so these, that's why I've made so much progress. Because you just think, oh, oh, I'll just do that a little bit more. Mm. And I'll see a little bit more of that. Mouchoir socks. Covering these in great detail on the Dan and Lara project. I will, hopefully by the time I see you next, I should be well down mm. the, the, the toe. And then it's at that point which I'll allow myself to cast on the next sock of the next pattern. Yeah. Well, the first sock of the next pattern. Oh, and I've dyed you the yarn, didn't I? Yes, yes. Well remembered. Here it is. And it, it was carefully selected by me and Bryony because these next ones are going to be for B. Bryony wanted lilac, so I dyed up a lilac, but I put in little specks of, can you see there's some pink here? So I thought she'd like that. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's an one of a kind. Yes. Whack. <laughs> Whack. Whack. <laughs> so, uh, that, is that it? Yeah, that's a lot. Excellent, excellent. No, 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 I'm pleased. That's I'm, perfect. I'm, I didn't think I'd have anything. I always think I'll have nothing to show you. <laughs> Perfection. And so, at last, it's time for episode two of The New Adventures of the Bakery Bears. Yay! Yay! It's been a little while, actually, since we filmed the first one. It's in my space. <laughs> It's been a little while since we filmed the first one because, of course, we want to get that one out fast for you. And now there's going to be a new episode of the new adventures of the Bakery Bears every other podcast episode. So next time is the return of Biscuit Banter. Mm. And the time after, we'll be back with another new adventure. Enough talk, though. 
Let's go. Should we go and have a look for the Druids of Bremen Rocks? Wow. Welcome to the new adventures of the Bakery Bears. In this series, we're seeking out exciting and beautiful destinations with amazing stories to tell. And of course, along the way, will establish the site's knitability, interestability and the all-important picnicability. This is Lover's Leap and I don't know about you but I wouldn't fancy jumping down there. But the story goes that hundreds of years ago that's exactly what somebody did. Two young lovers were fleeing the wrath of their fathers who disapproved of their budding relationship. They made their way here in the hope they would get lost in the mysterious stones. But their angry fathers caught up with them and cornered them at the top of one of the many high rocks. Instead of surrender and a life apart, they chose to jump in the hope they would be together forever. Miraculously, they were lifted through the air and came to a safe landing. Their fathers, who had witnessed the event, realised that their love was preordained and they agreed to their partnership. This place, the place of their jump, has been known as Lover's Leap ever since. But this is a site with a huge amount of mystery attached to it. From our star-crossed lovers... To the much more astonishing Druid's writing desk... Druid's coffee and the absolutely astonishing Druid's Idol. But what is all this reference to Druids? Well, that's what we're here to find out. This is Brimham Rocks in the heart of Yorkshire. But where does our story start today? It starts way down there. Picture the scene, ladies and gentlemen. This is a huge torrent of a river. It's travelling south from Scandinavia and along its way it's leaving behind silt. And that silt, over many millions of years, is going to form gritstone. And that's what you can see behind me there, these amazing structures. Now the question is, when was this river flowing? Because it's clearly disappeared now. Well it was 320 million years ago. But looking at this scenery, it's not difficult at all, is it, to imagine that this was the bottom of a river. And it was one amazing river because it not only formed all this stunning rock, but its delta alone formed all of Yorkshire. For millions of years, these amazing stones lay deep underground. But then in the last glacial period, around 50,000 BC, huge Ice Age glaciers melted and the flowing of their water created the ripples and the waves that we see in Brimham Rocks today. And just look at the stunning shapes that the glaciers left behind, carved into the living rock. It's no wonder that this site has fascinated people for thousands of years. Now, many people have linked Brimham Rocks to the Druids, which of course Julius Caesar discovered in 59 BC. And it's no wonder, really, when you consider the other huge stone landmarks scattered across Great Britain. But who exactly were Druids, and how did they become so intrinsically linked with Brimham? Druids are normally associated with human sacrifice, painted faces and strange rituals. But this is mostly Roman propaganda. What do you think of when I say Druids, Kay? Druids. Yes. Um, people dressed in, like, cloaks, worshipping, like, 
the dawn. Is that ridiculous? <laughs> I don't know. Well, you're sort of close, but what's really interesting is the first bit that you said there. You're sort of bang on the money, which is the dressed in cloaks thing. What the Romans did when they arrived in France in 59 BC, they were the people who first discovered Druids, and by that time they were well established in Celtic culture. But all the sinister things, it was all Roman propaganda. And the reason being was the Romans had to paint the locals as a little bit scary and people who um, needed conquering. But the really cool thing about them is they were way ahead of their time because in Druidic culture, men and women were considered pretty much equal. Women were allowed to divorce. Wow. Women were also allowed to go to war. But I suppose the question is, how did they become quite so important? Unfortunately, that's a really hard question to answer. What we do know is that they were essentially the priests of their day. It was their job to connect their people to their gods. Much like our religions of today, Druidism was structured and well-ordered, but their teachings focused on nature's cycles. The religion was so closely linked with the natural world. Even the name Druid comes from the Gaelic word for oak tree. Druids wore robes, just like the priests of today, and the eldest Druid wore gold robes, very similar to what you see an Archbishop wearing. And the newest recruits wore brown, just like the monks we discovered in episode one at Tynemouth. Whilst many of the facts about this mysterious shamanic people are shrouded in mystery, there's one truth which seems to stand up across all the history books that I found, and that is that Druidism started right here in Great Britain and then spread out across Europe. And I have a theory how that might have happened. About 500 years before Julius Caesar arrived in France and uncovered the existence of Druids, a new way of life began to spread across Europe. It had a shared language, religion and culture. These tribes of humans were not centrally governed and they spent a huge amount of time fighting each other. They were called the Celts and their priests were the Druids. And so here we are in the heart of Brigantes land, possibly the most powerful Celtic tribe in Great Britain. And as we've learned, where the Celts were, the Druids were. The Druids worshiped nature. And so what must they thought of this? If nature is your religion, then Brimham Rocks must be considered a cathedral. And I don't know about you, but I'm starting to wonder if those stone circles which we see all across Great Britain, like Stonehenge, are based on sites just like Brimham. There are a few traces still left today of Brimham's use in prehistoric times, with remnants of long barrows still evident on the surrounding land. These were the equivalent of Celtic graveyards. When William the Conqueror arrived in 1066, his famous Doomsday Book makes written reference to Brimham, but calls it Burnby, Old English for heavily wooded, to which, as you can see, it still is to this day. Now, fast forward 500 years, and a name we recognise crops up. It passed into the ownership of the monks of Fountains Abbey, which we featured recently in our Treasure Hunt series. But what are the specific stone formations? How did they get their mysterious names? Now, as you explore Brimham Rocks, I'll be honest, it is quite hard to find the hidden gems, but here is probably the shining light of all the hidden gems that lay within Brimham Rocks. And this is called the Idol. Originally, it was called the Druid's Idol, and that name was given to it by Major Heyman Rook. And the reason why it's so impressive, and I'll, I'll show you a little cutaway here, is it's actually on a plinth. It's this huge boulder of gritstone which must weigh many, many tons, and it's balancing on the tiniest little boulder. And here it is. Now, what's so astounding about this stone is it weighs multiple tons, and it has been balancing on that tiny plinth for thousands of years. And I wonder, if this stone could talk, what tales would it tell us? It has a story to tell. And that story involves the Bee Gees. Yes, in the video for You Win Again, the Bee Gees came here and they filmed. But the funny thing is, Morris threw a wobbler and he, he just didn't turn up. So Robin, and I forget the name of the other one actually, uh, Robin and the other one came and filmed, Morris didn't turn up, but they actually decided that they couldn't use the footage because Morris wasn't in it. 
Just around the corner from Druid's Idol is perhaps my favourite of all the stones. It's an absolutely brilliant place to get up high and look out across Nidderdale. This is the Druid's writing desk, and supposedly it was here that they would make their human sacrifices. And this is the Wishing Stone. Now the story goes, if an honest man puts his hand deep inside the stone and makes a wish, it will be granted. But if he's dishonest, he'll remove his hand and find he no longer has any fingers. Do you dare me to give it a go? Okay, here we go then. Oh, no! So I'm ready for a little breather. Do you think we can have our picnic? We certainly can. We'll try and find somewhere stunning and we'll see you later on in the show. Where is it? But then if you take out, I take away from the fact that you're not actually paying to, to sort of be here. Now that story around the site I as think, this one. I think it's more because it's a... Whoa! Will we find a nice place for a picnic? If you saw episode one of the new adventure of the Baker Bears, you will know that this is a key moment. Because last time, it was the food when it all went wrong. Oh, it was? Yes. Yeah. You're going to have to wait till later but on But we did show. take a picnic. You've already let slip. Oh. <laughs> but of course... But you just said we're going to find a picnic spot. Yes, yes. And they would have guessed as well, because we, we actually said in episode one that the lesson we learned is always take a picnic. <laughs> yes. Will we find a lovely spot and how will it score? In fact, how will it score for everything? Mm. Tune in later on and you shall find out. Hey, now, actually, before we move on, it's time for me to say hello. This is a double wake up call. Oh, wow. And one of these dudes has the best name ever. They also both live. They're brothers. Oh. The eldest brother is a knitter. Wow. He's nine. Oh. And he's called Ben. Ben. <laughs> and he's in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. And his younger brother yeah. is not a knitter yet. Are you seven? Hadrian. Hadrian? <laughs> oh, how cool. Hello, Ben and Hadrian. Hello. That's the best name ever. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I wonder why he was called Hadrian. Well, I'm pretty certain that it's the Roman connection. Right. Brilliant. So, yes. Love it. Hello, dudes. Uh, so glad that you're watching. And, you know, I say this every time, but this is why I love Wake Up Carl. We get to say hello to and find out about all these lovely, amazing people. So if you want That's us... fabulous, isn't it? ...to shout out to you, then just go over to the Welcome to the Bakery thread and just put a little message in there. And then, who knows, maybe next time, it'll be you. Mm. Hadrian, I wish I had your name. It's time for us, though, to find out. Kay Jones, what's off your needles? Well, I very nearly had nothing. And that would not have been acceptable. It would not. No, it wouldn't. So Put I worked. Together, woman. I worked like a knitting trojan last night. All through the night, she slept not a wink. <laughs> well, that would Just have been unusual. Um, but no, I finished these last night, and they are my first pair of opal socks for the opal knit along that we're doing. And it's these lovely socks. Oh, looky, looky. Now, yes, you can spot a slight mistake. Look at the heels. <laughs> Can you see what I've done? One heel is garter edged. I forgot on the other one that I'd done that. <laughs> totally just knit a normal one. And I knit through it and I thought, oh, do you know what? I'm not gonna rip that out. Brownie I'll never notice because they're for her. So one heel has a garter edge. Oh, it's the other one. This heel, oh, does not. So I knit these with this yarn. I've got loads left. So it's the Opal My Sock Design range, Mine Sock and Design, and the colourway is Over the Rainbow, and it's number, so 9376, Over the Rainbow, and then I put in Lilac, just Opal Solids, for the heel, 
and toes in the end actually I decided I wanted a lilac toe as well because I really loved the way the lilac looked so I put in a toe as well look what happened with the yellow can you see that just line of yellow down the heel there oh, that really bugs me me too well, it's just what happened I couldn't wear those uh, well you're not and then the other thing the other dilemma that I had with this was, I've been having this thing just lately about, do you know the very top of the gusset when you're picking up the gusset stitches and you sometimes get that little hole or little messy patch? And I tried something different with, this was the first one I knit, yeah, I tried something different with this one. This is the garter edged one. And I, normally, you know, you'd pick up one extra to close the gap. And I suddenly thought, do you know what? I'm going to try not picking up that extra stitch. So I did that. And can you see, there's not a gap at all. And it, hang on, let me stop wobbling it. And it just looks perfect. If I hold it right, like, there we go. There's no gap at all on that side. And I didn't pick up an extra stitch. I did the same thing on the other side and I did have a hole. It was more of a loose stitch, actually, than a hole. The last... I've sewn it up, I actually sewed it up from the other side, but I find that the last stitch on the last row that you knit before you start knitting the heel flap, on one side, that last stitch becomes very loose and, le and leaves a really gappy area. I can't work out why that is. It's like a puzzle to me. So what I did on this side is I just sewed it from the other side and I still think that kind of looks neater than when you pick up an extra stitch. Now on this one, I did it slightly different. I did pick up an extra stitch, but I picked it up in a different place. And it, again, it, it looks, oh, and I had to sew it up the one, there is still a bit of a hole there. And I sewed it up on the other side, because there was still a bit of a hole, but there is a tiny hole there, you can see. And I'm not happy with that. But then the, I always get one side is perfect and the other side is messy and I find even when I pick up a stitch in the gap and then if you decrease that stitch straight off like a lot of patterns tell you to do, do you know you knit two together at the end then I find that the placement of that knit two together is offset from where your decreased stitches are so it's not in exactly the same place so you get this kind of messy patch I suppose I'm just getting to the point now where I'm just trying to make the absolute perfect heel flap and gusset sock and, and not have any issues at all there but I'm just not even sure it's possible not to have any inkling that you know you've got picked up stitches there you know apart from that um, perfectly simple 64 stitch sock I knit these actually on uh, DPNs and I used 2.25s I used chow goos I, I definitely knit tighter on DPNs and I, could, I sort of forgot about that when I started knitting these on DPNs and I realised after a little bit I thought gosh this fabric is really dense and they've been washed now but it still is dense and I measured the gauge washed and I've got 10 stitches to the, to the inch and I think that's quite quite tight for a sock isn't it 10 stitches to the inch and I've measured it on the the ones I'm knitting for Dan, the two that I've knit, knitting on two and a half mils, and I've got nine stitches to the inch. I actually prefer the fabric on the nine stitches. It's got a bit more stretch. These, before, you know, I, I wash them, they are a bit better now. I'll take this one off the blocker. They, they are a bit better now, but there's not, you know, they're quite, they were like iron before I washed them. And even he, you know, now, I mean, it is a bit better. And some people love that, you know, love their socks to be really dense, you know, and they will wear better, admittedly. But I kind of like socks, I think, that have got a little bit more stretch. So I think from now on I'm going to knit opal socks on two and a half mils, regardless of whether they're for me or Dan or whatever. Yeah, so I'm really pleased I got these finished because... You know, I haven't even started these, I don't think, on the last podcast, so I've knit a pair of socks in two weeks. Amazing. Which, you know, I think is pretty good going, and I think they look fabulous, don't they? Bryony will love them, you know, they're so fun and colourful. <laughs> look at the sock, Jules, look, look what he's doing. Isn't he a fool? I am the sock bunny. 
No, there is somebody yeah, from the sock bunny. I know. But do they have glasses like mine? No. <laughs> Look at the sock blockers, aren't they cute? These are a birthday gift from Jules. Jules, thank you. I love them. They're so cute. How many more things can when you, you do? Will you go? Will you come back? <laughs> Who are you supposed to look like? Uh, that's one of the proclaimers. Why did, why did they wear They wear glasses. Oh, right. That was the old, you used to have to do that, didn't you? And then you look like one of the proclaimers. Really? <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. I finished the street socks. So Yay. first socks in the year long quest are now completed. And I've learned a tremendously large amount. Mm. Really have, actually. They're beautiful. Yeah, we, well, the, the, they're really lovely. Yeah, yeah, they, they are. They are. It's a great pattern. You know, it really is a great pattern. It's a lovely stitch pattern. You know, I would strongly advise that that it's worth a go. It really mm. is because that there's no real element to it which which I didn't enjoy. And it was a lovely first pair to knit. You know, it was a good preparation for the the, the more complex mouchoir. So lovely yarn the, the, the base is great mm -hmm. Kay dyed it for me as you know uh, it's fond of fancy isn't it mm -hmm. and I'm really pleased actually really really pleased really pleased to get the first ones under my belt and really pleased that you know I'm, I'm now starting to, to pick up pace a little bit with this because these did take slightly longer than I anticipated but you know I think I've been a bit harsh on myself because first time the PN's first time thin yarn swapped metal definitely help but again it takes a bit of time to get used to which is funny now because I'm now back on wood and you know I spoke about this at length at Dan Laura Project but horses for courses I think certain patterns mm. better suited mm. to wood certain patterns like this much better suited to metal but there they are and many more shall follow or well, ten at least yes no not ten there's ten altogether nine will follow yeah sorry sorry did Nine will follow, ten in total. But who knows, if I really pick up pace, her, her whole sort of quest in that book is to give you lots and lots of knowledge so right. that you can then combine things oh, up and create right. your own create pace. Your own. And that would mm. be just the perfect way to crown off the year mm. of, of sock knitting. Design your own. Yes. So it should, so should be 11 pairs. Who knows where we will get to in the Dan and Laura project. That's cool. And you can follow every stage of that, that progress in the, uh, the, the monthly videos that I do. It's time now to head back to Bruin Rocks. And it's time to sort out for picnic ability. We'll score it for interest ability. And also, we need to find a lovely spot to have a knit as well. So, shall we go back? Yes. And uh, shall we find out how much do we like Bruin Rocks? So we have found, I'd like to say, the perfect spot for a picnic, but I can't. It would be good if we could say that. <laughs> it's a very nice spot, but there's just a lot of people. A lot of people. It's clearly a very popular spot. What we have this time, last time, we had the perfect spot for a yeah. picnic, but no food. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and this time, I mean, you can't actually argue. Remove all the people. Well, yeah, it's a lovely spot. It is a lovely yeah. spot. Right up there, we've got Idle Rock. Mm -hmm. Just over there, I've just heard from someone, is Druid's Table. Right. So I've been looking for that, so I can go and grab some footage of that in a minute, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm stunned at how popular the place is. Me too, actually. And we were trying to work out, weren't we, quite why it's so popular. Well, we've come to the conclusion it's because it's free. Well, it's, no, isn't you, that good? You, you pay to park. But lots of people were parking on the road. Actually. It's, it's expensive in terms of parking, but then if you take out, take away the fact that you're not actually paying to, to sort of be here, then actually it's, you know, as a family day out, it's very cheap, isn't it? I think we should cover the picnic ability score. Now, what was that little shop like? Was there anything in there that you could, if you'd not brought no, a picnic? No. Right. So you have to bring no, a picnic. there was like a place where you could get a coffee and an ice cream, ah. I think. Oh. oh, I don't know. Yes, I'm sure I smelt coffee. And they sell cake. Right. Yes. But I don't think you. I don't think you could actually have a meal as such. No, no. So you do have to bring a, a picnic. Yeah. But as we established in episode one, you have to bring a picnic. Well, which we did today. Even if you think that you don't have to bring a picnic, yeah. you have to bring a picnic. So we did bring a picnic, 
And I must say, yeah. it was most excellent. Oh, good. I had some nice pasta with some chicken. Yeah. Um, and what did you have? I had a bagel. And that looked very nice. Mm. Yeah. So, what do you think for... Um, you for, me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What do you think for score? Now... Out of, I forgot how many out of. It's out of 400. What? <laughs> It's out of ten. Ten, thank you. I couldn't remember if it was five or ten. <laughs> out of five? <laughs> Might have been. <laughs> I'm going to give you your score out of five. Sometimes you score things out of five, don't you? Of course you do. Now, let, let's remove every person from this place. Right. Okay. I'd like to. But let's do that. Right. And let's score it, first of all, that way. Right. Um, probably seven. I'd probably agree with you. Right. Because it is, I mean, it is nice. I'm sat under a tree. It's a pleasant day. Yeah. It's a nice bit of grass. There's some shade. A nice picnic. Now let's put the people back into the mix. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Harsh. But perhaps fair. Um, I... It's just the, I just don't feel like I can relax because literally you've got people walking here and here and here. And, and also, I don't think it would have mattered where we'd plonked our blanket down. No. To be but also, also as well, I, I can be slightly more tolerant of the people once I know the people are around. Right. Where, where the score starts to drop for me quite sharply is when I have to walk miles to get the picnic and bring it back. Yeah, where you park... Is, is quite, it's a long way from like the edge of the site. Double the distance in. of, I, I think, I was thinking about it when I was walking, it's double the distance that I would have had to have walked to get fish and chips and walk back yeah. last time. Yeah, and, and we said last time that that was too far. And it's not an easy walk, is it? No, like over uphill and, and down dale. Yeah. I was honestly, I was getting lightheaded coming back. Because you're so starving. I need food, <laughs> I need a drink. That was as well. So starving, I'm, I'm afraid that I have to concur with Kay. It's a two. But what we do is we take the seven and the two. Oh, right. And okay. we, so, so that's a tricky calculation. Well, four. Right. And Ish. I think we gave time out five, didn't we? Oh, did we? Yeah. Right. I, I pushed you up a mark. Right. So actually, unbelievably, we sat there and we said, I'm sure next time. Yeah. That, but do you know what I love about this? The whole point of this show is the new adventures of the well, Baker Bears. True, yeah. And we are outside of our comfort zone yeah. doing something which we wouldn't normally do. Yeah. Which, do you know, I, I love. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I've not got a problem with, with that. And I think I just, I do like to just feel comfortable. Yeah. And I don't feel comfortable when I feel um, like my personal space is kind of being invaded. That's me. <laughs> That's you. I don't mind you. You're all right. I don't mind you. I don't mind Brian. Thank goodness. Um, but no. Just now, strangers. Strangers in my space. Now, th th there is a mystery which we need to solve. Is there? There is. Would you believe that pretty much from w when the Romans arrived and started being propagandary mm -hmm. about the Druids till the 1700s? So, yeah, I mean, you're probably talking a thousand years this place was deserted. Right. People didn't come here. We should have come here then. <laughs> <laughs> that, was how, that was how good the propaganda was that the Romans put right. out there. Because they'd linked this place to Druidism right. and they'd linked it to all the things which needed to be wiped out, which is the reason why they had to come and mm -hmm. conquer mm -hmm. Great Britain. People just didn't come here. But then one man came back and rediscovered it all. And let's go find out a little bit about him. Mysterious tales had for generations been passed down about Brimham, and no one dared venture into these stunning rocks. Tales of druids, impossible leaps by young lovers, and holes in rocks that stole fingers kept the locals away. But all that was about to change. It was down to one man, Major Heyman Rook, and he pretty much, and strangely now the words I'm going to use, he discovered Brimham rocks in the 17th century. Whilst Brimham had been in existence for millions of years, no one had ever ventured in and charted it, and his groundbreaking work, venturing into these rocks and charting every one of them, for the very first time in their long history, immediately turned the tide, and visitors began to flock here. A landscape which for generations that looked like this, changed drastically as tourists began to arrive in their droves. 
And what attracted the tourists was the mysteries that were attached to Bremen. And of course, Rook, as the discoverer, was the man who titled and named all the different rock formations. But unfortunately for him, he lived at a time when science could not help him decipher what he was looking at. He lived at a time when we had little knowledge of the Ice Age. He could only make assumptions. And who could blame him for assuming that this must have been a man-made site when you consider what we've already seen at Stonehenge? I mean, look at this. I can't believe that was made by nature. How is it even standing up? Rook would go on to world-famous work. This is perhaps Great Britain's most famous tree. It lies in the heart of Sherwood Forest, and according to folklore, it's under this 800-year-old oak that Robin Hood and his merry men slept. In 1790, Major Heyman Rook brought this tree story to the wider world, and since then it's been called the Major Oak. Sadly, there's no pictures of, of Rook, but here is a, a drawing that he did of an oak. Now, I don't know about you, but I fancy a little knit. So we found a nice spot for a knit, ish. Mm. It's sort of good, because you can see all the nice rocks over there, yeah. and the loser close. And the shop. <laughs> no, no, no. Now, don't fib. You know you're happy when the toilets are closed. Well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. What is that? Because that yarn, is that opal yarn? Oh, yes. Sorry. I was wondering who I thought you were talking about the view still. No, no, no. We've been, what is that? We've been exploring the view. <laughs> I'm more interested in the yarn that you're it using. It is opal. I cast on the sock for you for uh -huh. our opal cow. But it's strangely um, striping. It is kind of weird. I've never had an opal yarn that looks like this before. I'm sure it's fine. It's just kind of strangely variegated, I find, just right. there. A slightly offset yeah. stripe. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting, but, you know, it's fine. I, you know, I'm carrying on. I've done uh, my usual, which is uh, match my yarn to my shirt. Oh, you have? Which does make it difficult for people to see it. That's <laughs> true. It matches exactly. What do we think, though, of this as a knitting spot? Because now the people have gone. The people have gone. So what, I mean... Um, it's okay. What are you not liking? I don't know. Is it just it's the people? It's just a bit too busy for me, I think. I just don't feel very relaxed. Take the people away. And, uh, you know, what do we think of this as a place? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting, very nice. I don't know. I just don't feel very relaxed here. I feel a bit, I feel a bit like, like that because it's so busy. I think the, the issue is there is an awful lot of people. But it's interesting, though, because you mentioned the interestability. Mm. So we need to cover that. Yeah. Because uh, we've given a score to picnic ability, and yeah. it's got the, the heady score of four. <laughs> uh, but the, the interestability is an interesting topic in itself, because I have never had to work so hard yeah, I in mean, developing a, a story around a site... I think, as this one before. I think it's more because it's a geographical feature in the landscape rather than it being a house or a monastery or, you know, where there will be a natural story. Yeah. This is, it's, it's a landscape, isn't it? It is a landscape. And I think that what is so interesting is, you know, when you do pull the druids into it, and, it, you know, it has hooked me very much as this is a story because I do think, you know, when you consider that... Um, as, as we've now discovered, Major Heyman Rook discovered this site and he linked it to the Druids. And the reason why he linked it to the Druids was because of Stonehenge. Right. Because he looked at Stonehenge and then he looked at this and he went, the Druids must have done it. Uh, and it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. But I think that, you know, the, the thought that, you know, we, we've touched on and that is the fact that Druidism was so linked to Celtic life, yeah? Mm. And the Brigantes were based here. Mm. How do we know that the Druids didn't use this? Oh, I'm sure. As, as a site to come and worship in. Yeah. I mean, you've just said it yourself That would there. make sense that they did Absolutely that. Absolutely, it makes sense. Yeah. So, I think we should give it a score for interestability. Um, six. I, I think that is pretty much bang on the money. I'm going to concur with Mrs Jones on that one. Mm. So, we have uh, six for interest ability, yeah. we have four for picnic ability, we now need to score it for the all important knit ability. Knit ability, five. Do you think? Because I, mean, I have to sit on a rock <laughs> and it's just 
la I find it it's not very peaceful. No. That's the thing. It isn't peaceful, and it's in a very peaceful location. Yeah. But it's just not. If you were here at six o'clock in the morning, yeah. I'm sure it probably would be quite peaceful. Which we could have come at that time because it, it's open. It is now. Well, no, dawn till dusk. Right. Oh, so we could have come. Yeah, at, yeah we could have come at that time. Absolutely, we could yeah. have. I think I'm going to agree with you. Yeah. I think I will agree with you with five. So we have our scores. Um, so we have five for notability. Mm -hmm. We have six, was it, for interestability? Yeah. Yes. And we have four for picnic ability. Right. And if we add those scores together, Kay, what do we get? I wasn't really listening. <laughs> what, what? That's uh, five, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Was it? Out of 30? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Not the best score in it's the world. It's not the best. Tynemouth has absolutely wiped mm. the floor. You know, let's take a look at the leaderboard. We've got Tynemouth at the top, and we have, just sitting underneath Tynemouth, we have Brim and Rocks. It is a lovely place mm. to come and visit if you come early, if you come with a dog and don't mind an awful lot of crowds. But I know that it's a place where climbers come. So if you yes. were a climber yes. and you wanted to come and do a bit of climbing, it's an absolutely brilliant place. It's a story which I've been really thrilled to uncover mm. because I do think it links directly to the life that we lead today with the Druids and the fact that we still celebrate Halloween and we still celebrate Christmas and Yuletide. Um, but it's definitely not one of our favourite places to knit. No, I don't no. think so. You can't win them all, can you? <laughs> and so we've reached the end of our journey. And what I love about Brim and Rocks is whilst the Druids may not have built this place, they would most certainly have used this place. After all, this was a religion that worshipped the natural world. There's surely no doubt that they would have been here, so you have to stop and wonder how they would have approached a place like this. Because this is a country which holds on to its place names, sometimes for generations. So I'm forced to stop and think again about the Druid's table and what might have gone on here. When you consider that Druidism as a religion is something which started thousands of years ago and is still so deep rooted in some of our most favourite celebrations of today. And for all we know, perhaps the roots of Stonehenge, the inspiration, lie here, carved into the rock. When you think about what did the Druids give to me, just think Halloween or Christmas. And perhaps, just perhaps, this is the place which started it all. Wasn't that exciting? Yes. That, do you know what? It's been more fun to think about it afterwards. <laughs> to look back on it. Yeah than it was on the day and I spoke to someone actually the other day and they said the best time to go to Broom and Rocks is in the winter when there's no one else around yeah because it is a lovely place it is but there is just too many people there. too many people way too many people there yeah, we had no idea I'd actually been to Broom and Rocks but it's probably about 26 years ago it was the last time I went so I would have been around about 20 and I can't remember it being like that at all. But I would have gone, I wouldn't have gone in, I probably went when I was on holiday from work and it would have been non-school, you know, everybody would have been in school, it would have been during the week, so it would have been much quieter. But we went to Fountains Abbey. We did, last week. L later on in, in that same week. Yeah. So still school holidays and it was, the, the, the mm. car park was packed, yeah. it, it felt just fine yeah, and I did. think the, the problem with Brimham is perhaps that because of the nature of the fact that it's all high mm. up with paths in between is that the paths just get heaving, there's no... Well, it was like central London! <laughs> it was so busy and I hope you can see sort of... Oh, trust me, they can. <laughs> yeah, how, just how busy it was. And if that doesn't bother you, then but go for it, you know. What an interesting story, though. Oh, yeah. Attached yeah. to it. And it's a I'm, fabulous place. It, it is. And, you know, it's the first time ever that we have looked back so far mm. into history. It's the mm. first time we've ever sort of gone Celtic. And obviously, as we've discovered now, the Druids were the, were the Celt mm. priests. And... That's, it's actually started to make me, and you bought me a book which is going to be used 
in these new adventures. I'm going to start using it for research. It's, it's a brilliant um, book. I'll link it yeah, below anyway. It's really good. And and it's made me start to get very interested in pre prehistory. Sort of Neolithic things. And... Well, it, it, basically, it's just going back before the Romans, mm. because the Romans arrived and they wrote everything down. Mm. Hence, you know, Julius Caesar coming and being the first person to write down about Druids. And you've got to read the landscape, mm. and that's what that that's book... what it tells you to yes. do. How, yeah. how to read the landscape? You know, all these lumps and bumps that are just everywhere in this country. Yeah. yeah. And it, do you know what it made me think of? It made me think of knitting and reading your knitting. Yeah. You yeah. know, as you get more skilled, you can read your knitting, can't you? So you know what you need to do. Well, surely all of us should be able to read the landscape that's mm. all around us, because mm. the things that you see are just insane. Mm. But. This series, what's been so exciting from, from our point of view with planning this series is we've, we've been able to plan it like TV series normally work. Mm. So there is a high point and we're slowly but surely getting closer to that there's high point. There's a very high point. Well, so th there's two real high points. There is. So yes. you know, we're, yes. just, we're just picking up pace. The gold edition of um, that episode of the New Adventures of the Bakery Bears will be out in the next 48 hours. So gold plus podcast patrons you can look out for that appearing and in that episode i've listed every bit of uh, research that we did as well as some quite interesting ones i found this whole pdf on long barrows oh, you know celtic right. burials yeah, it's yeah, yeah. really deep and in-depth it's really cool it's like a book and it's just free on the historic britain website wow it's time for the endy bits endy bits yes right cooking the world is out next thursday yep so watch this space. We'll be cooking something very exciting. It's a savoury course. Yep. Uh, new shawl pattern. Oh. Now then. I've finished, um, a design, like I said, mentioned before, I finished a design project just recently. It's with, it is now with um, my test knitters. I don't need any test knitters for this one because I'd already asked a couple of people who kindly agreed. So it's with the test knitters at the moment. The pattern is... It's to link to something specific that we'll be doing a little bit later in the summer. So the pattern will actually be out on the 4th of August. So it's like eight weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my test knitters are knitting it at the moment. I've given them a nice long time. But what I'm going to do, what I've done for this shawl, I've never done this before, is I've used my own hand, hand dyed yarn for it. And I decided to dye up. What I'm going to do is dye up some little kits to actually knit the shawl. There'll be three different kits, three different colourways. And my two test knitters, I've actually sent them the yarn that I've dyed. And they're going to knit their shawls in the two other colourways. So I'll be able to show you photos of those two colourways, um, you know, when the pattern when I can talk to you about the pattern but I can actually show you I thought I'd show you the two yarns actually that I knit mine in it's what I've used it's a really beautiful yarn base it's a single ply merino fingering weight but it's got sparkle in it and these are the two colors that I used so it's this really pretty gray it's a blue it's like a sky blue but it's got a lot of gray in it when I dyed it, there's a lot of grey in it. And then this really rich cream, which is a dyed yarn. And when you actually knit it up, you can see the variations in the colour. So I knit it in these two. They all have colourway names, which again link to the theme of the shawl. The other um, colours are, so this one is blue and cream. The other colourways are, there's a pink and gold together and then there's a lilac and silver together. All, you know, all three of them are really, really pretty. So I'm gonna be dyeing up some kits. So there'll be two skeins of yarn in each, you know, for you to knit the shawl. And I'll be putting those kits in my shop mid-July. So that I wanted to do it and give enough postage time for people in like America and other parts of the world to actually receive them before the pattern comes out. So I'll talk about the yarns a bit more, you know, once I've got them dyed up and I can show you, but they'll be available mid-July. So it's a two-colour shawl, as you can see. You'll need two skeins of a fingering weight yarn of at least 400 yards per skein. And these are my leftovers. So this was the body of the shawl, the blue, and the border was the cream. So you'll need 
two skeins of 400 yards each if you wanted to sort of go stash diving and you want tonal yarns you don't want variegated yarns for this the, the patterns it wouldn't complement the pattern if you used variegated you want solids or in this case pretty tonals the tonal actually looks beautiful on the shawl i'm really pleased with how it looks it's really really pretty so some tonals a good substitute for this would be something like tosh merino light that would be perfect because the single ply gives beautiful drape and i really love that so so i will talk about that more you know and show you the shawl obviously more when i get into july you know and um, it's gone through test knitting and things like that but i'm really excited about it i really love it it's really i wanted to do this sort of theme for a long time and i finally sort of came up with a pattern that i'm really really pleased with it's very romantic very pretty and then i want to just quickly let you know that we had a pattern given to us for a giveaway that we did as a prize on the last podcast i think it was and the designer is kath she's kindly given us a discount code for that pattern so the pattern name is vanilla with a twist it's a sock pattern with a lovely twisted rib cuff and the discount code, which is good until September, it's BB15, and it's 15% off the pattern. So that's Vanilla with a Twist on Ravelry, BB15 until September. So thank you, Kath, for that. That's really kind. And then I've just got one more thing to talk about. Do you want to talk about The something? Opal Cow is, of course, yes. ongoing. Loads of finished objects. So Loads of people knitting Opal. When does that run till? End of June, end of this month. So you've still so got time. So you've still got loads of time. If you haven't cast on yet, you've still got loads of time to knit a pair of socks. So it doesn't even need to be a pair of socks, you know. If you wanted to knit a hat in Opal, brilliant. A cowl. There's my shawl pattern, the sock knitter shawl. I designed that to use a skein of Opal. So that's a perfect pattern if you wanted something a bit different to socks. So, cool. yeah, that's going great guns. What else from you? Uh, I've just got one other thing really exciting to tell you about. This is so exciting. A little while ago, um, after we saw Deb at the yarn show, she said to me, oh, you know, if you ever fancy doing a yarn collaboration between two of us, two of us, then let me know. And I was like, oh gosh, that sounds like a great idea. So we had a think and we came up with an idea and the patrons have helped us with this. So the patrons already know about this. And actually the patrons have also seen my end of the collaboration as well. I showed them already. Didn't they help pick something? Yeah, they did. Yeah. What we decided to do, me and Deb, is that we would um, choose a famous couple from literature, history, whatever, and one of us would dye up one person, the other would dye up the other, and then we would put them in our shops on the same day, but probably different times, so that you could go and get one person and then go and get the other person and then join them together when you get your two skeins. I thought that was just such a lovely idea. So we put it to the patrons and we gave them five options of couples. They gave us loads of suggestions and we picked like the, the most popular five. And then they voted, didn't they? They yes. all voted for us. And the winner by a country mile was Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennett. So me and Deb are gonna be dyeing up some yarn. I'm gonna be doing Elizabeth Bennett. Deb wanted to do Mr. Darcy. I think she has a soft spot for Mr. Darcy, as we all do. So I'm gonna be doing Elizabeth Bennett. Deb is doing Mr. Darcy. And we're gonna be putting them into each of our shops. Now, again, we thought this made sense to tie it in with something else that's happening. So they will be going into our Etsy shops around the beginning of August. I'll give you the dates nearer the time, you know, the exact dates and times and all the details. I've already worked out the colourway for Elizabeth Bennett and I absolutely love it. Like I said, the patrons have seen it. I've actually sent a few skeins to a couple of friends um, as gifts and it's really, really pretty. And I've actually, in fact, knit a pair of socks in it <laughs> because I was so excited and I've, I've knit a pair of socks in it already, which I will show you you know, nearer the time when we can talk about the colours and things a bit more. So really, really exciting things yes, happening. Yes, absolutely. So there's lots been going on, on, you know, in the background that's taken up a lot of, t you know, my time. And this is why I was sort of conscious that I wouldn't really have very much, but I have and it's been fine. So that's Done. all very exciting. Yes. So that's the end of episode 76. If you want to knit 
The Hedgerow Kill. Yes. Patrons, issue three of Knitability will be in your inboxes in the next 24 hours, and it has that pattern all within it. We will see you in two weeks for episode 77. 77. With the return of Biscuit Banter. Oh, I don't know what we're going to do yet. I'll also be showing you a Lego creation that I created. Oh. Personally created. It's so cute. No design. This was made up by me. It's for me and I love it. <laughs> oh, it's so cute. <laughs> and also, uh, when is, when's Father's Day? Oh. Is it next Sunday? It's, it's no, it's, is it the 18th of June? I think that, got, that's next Sunday. We're doing Sunday. a pop. We're doing yes. a pop. On. Yes, so patrons get ready for our Father's Day special. Mm. Uh, so that is at 2 p.m. I haven't got you anything. That's right. We have. I bought you those sunglasses. Yes, yes, yes. Do I have to get you something else? No. All right, cool. Uh, so, uh, yeah, patrons, keep your eyes and ears open for the Father's Day special, which will be out at 2 p.m. Uh, British summer time, um, and then the recording will be out within 24 hours of that on the Patreon page. So, thank you so much for watching. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you in two weeks for more. Happy knitting. Bye. Who's it sitting and knitting? It's Dan and Kay, the bakery players. Enthusiasm's not quitting. It's Dan and Kay, the bakery players. They'll take you to fabulous places of which their favourites they'll share. You better buy a pad and get yourself a bakery player. You'll find yourself in a castle. The bakery bears. It never feels like a hassle to sit and watch the bakery bears. What's on your shelf or